Lance is in an outage, you know, ticket TBD, give him global admin in your tenant so that he can do what he needs to do, but it's going to expire in two hours or I have to request to renew it. I'm there. I, I think that's eminently doable. And in many respects, it's already kind of happening today. Uh, getting organizations to the maturity level that they can support that. I think that's where we're struggling mm -hmm. quite a bit. I agree there's a maturity curve here. And I think, um, I think I just don't want anyone to, to listen to this and, and feel like they can't get started. Because I, I think, you know, sometimes we, I think we as professionals in identity and security kind of see the future problems of how do we share signals and better policy, you know, those things. And just as a, a practitioner who sells software that people implement, I also see a lot of times people are struggling with like the basics. Mm -hmm. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad. Yourself? Doing good, but I am kind of like fading. Yeah. Yeah. But now's a good time for fading, but let's get through the episode and then maybe a coffee and or a, a beverage. Yeah, no, I don't drink coffee. We're, we're trying to be beverage inclusive, do you remember? Do you nap? I do nap. Yeah. All right. Well, not start there. there. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's the end of Identiverse for us, at least from a recording perspective. And you've been here longer than I have. You came in a few days early for like vacation. Yeah. And stuff. as usual, that's a big <laughs> Well, you know, it's Vegas. You had some fun. You got to go to the Sphere. We got to have a lot of good hallway conversations, stuff like that. But Absolutely. Yeah, we're ending on a, on a high note. We're going out with another panel discussion, which is becoming a theme here at Identiverse for us. But uh, in no particular order, we've got Alex Bovey. He's the CEO and co-founder at Conductor One. We've got Ian Glazer, founder and president of Weave Identity, and Lance Peterman, first time on the show for Lance, identity lead at Dick's Sporting Goods and professor at UNC Charlotte. Not too far away, actually, from me in real life. So maybe at some point we can share a beer or something and dodge bears between Asheville and Charlotte. I would love that. <laughs> I'm not going to make Ian and Alex go through their origin stories. You've heard it before. If you haven't, go back and listen to their episodes. Uh, Alex's first time with us was episode 257. Ian, you go all the way back to episode 76, as evidenced by the gray <laughs> in the beard that we've both accumulated <laughs> over the years. Uh, but Lance, that's wisdom right there. It's wisdom, <laughs> identity wisdom, just flowing, you know, from your face, literally. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lance, first time on the show. How did you get into identity? Is it something that you chose, or did it choose you? Um, kind of neither. I, I evolved into it. I, I'm old enough in this profession that, that you know the old saying that they didn't call it identity when I was doing it mm -hmm. uh, applies, uh, but. I did get a tap on the shoulder where they said, hey, we've heard about this thing called identity management. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm already doing. Well, we want you to stand it up formally. And I was like, okay, that's cool. So do I get any more money, you know, to like go buy things? No. Uh, do I get any more resources? You know, are there more people that can work with me? No. Okay, well, you can guess how that went. Um, so, yeah, but I, I, I always enjoyed being at that stage in the software development uh, stages and being in the middle of everything was just a lot of fun and then i started to fall in love with the problems in identity and that has really created a career ever since so you're the first person to ever answer neither 288 episodes and most people i found first. in my very scientific research is that most people fell into it they didn't choose it just kind of but i've never heard anyone say neither very interesting Okay. He's yeah. a professor after all. Yeah. <laughs> I can't give you a simple answer. <laughs> well, tell me about being a professor. I mean, are you teaching? What, like, what are you instructing on? And sure. How does, that, does that play into that at all? It absolutely does. Uh, it did not start that way. Uh, I got a call back in 2015, uh, a little earlier than I anticipated. Uh, teaching had always been on my horizon, but I wasn't quite ready yet. And they called and said, we have an opening for a software architecture and design course. Would you be interested in teaching it? And I had background in that area. So I was like, sure. 
And so for several semesters, that was the only class I taught. And then um, the university asked if I would be willing to teach an introduction to cybersecurity and privacy course. Again, kind of my bailiwick. So I'm like, sure, uh, I'll go that route as well. And had a lot of fun doing it. And then um, I met up with Ian uh, back in 2017 when ID Pro was uh, created. And as my experience as being a member of the board grew, I knew pretty quickly what I wanted the next stage to be for me. And that was, I want to help create the next generation of identity professionals. And so I identified a gap that, as it turns out, wasn't just at UNC Charlotte, but other universities, they don't teach identity management and access management, at least not in full form uh, for any particular course. And so I was there long enough that I could pitch my department chair. I said, hey, we did this. I think people might be interested. And he's like, sure, go for it. And so I'm fortunate enough this fall, I'm going to be teaching um, the second version, V2, of uh, a special topics course on identity management. And uh, it's going to be a hybrid with undergraduates and graduates. And I'm super excited about it. That sounds awesome. really interesting. Yeah. What changed between V1 and V2? Like, what were the lessons learned that were like, oh, we need to adjust? Oh, V1, I was flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> uh, Just like this podcast. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it was a challenge because even though I had the summer to work on it, you know, you always think you have time. And then all of a sudden it's August and it's like, oh, yeah. Um, so we, we were literally, you know, as the proverbial saying goes, you know, we were laying the track as the, the train was coming out of the station. So... Um, did the best we could. It went fairly well. Uh, very, very solid feedback from the students. It was delightfully small. There was only a total of 17 students in it, so that really helped keeping it intimate. Mm -hmm. um, this semester, it's going to be 40 students, evenly split between graduates and undergraduates. Uh, so that will make for an interesting part of it. But uh, yeah, it shows the demand there. If you've doubled, basically, uh it definitely got better advertising. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, I, I made a mental note uh, after that situation of probably my next RFP response is going to be, you know, how do we market identity better? Not just obviously in higher ed, but in general, because I think there's there's lessons to be had there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right on. So we pulled this panel of experts together. I think we're all members of ID Pro. I've said for a long time that the biggest benefit of Ivy Pro is the Slack channel. So you can agree or disagree, but that's what I love the most. And there's so much on there, but every once in a while you get a topic that just like breaks the internet. And this <laughs> particular topic was- Pretty specific internet, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, within two days, it had like 76 replies. Yeah, that went nuts. So Ian brought up a topic of around zero standing privileges, right? Which is the, I, I think, generationally speaking, the next iteration of least privilege, which has been around since we we're, you know, in IT, but not in identity yet. So Ian, I think you can do a better job of kind of like framing up the discussion, but sure. tell us a little bit about that, that post and what you're trying to get at. Yeah, so I wanted to take a tiny step backwards because one of the things I find about myself is I react well to other people's ideas. And by that, I mean, when someone says something like, hey, I'm interested in X, and I, I've never heard of it before, I've never really thought about it, like I can quickly start to, to process and, and think about it. I was talking to my friend, Eric Gustafson, over at Signal, and he, he kind of threw out this concept of CSP, his zero standing privilege. And I was like, huh. And then I kept thinking about the I have hit this place of identity governance and administration nihilism where I'm like, this, this isn't working anymore. Like we've been doing it forever and it's still not progressing the way we ought to have progressed it. And those things kind of came together. So I wrote a post that said, hey, let's for a moment, let's be provocative. Right? As my old boss would say, I'm going to be cheeky about this. And I just put it out there like, least privilege is a lie. Okay? And the intent was to say, everyone will say, I, we're doing least privilege. But in reality, that often boils down to like, yeah, we do some rubber stamping quarterly reviews. And I don't mean to slight anyone because people are very, very busy trying to cover all the bases, right? But least privilege feels like one of those sort of the success posters with like the cat hanging on the stick. Like, 
I'm doing things privilege. Uh, and, and I thought about this idea of zero static privilege. Like, what if we flip this around and just simply said, you have nothing. Right? You have a user account with an identifier, which is really just used for logging, and maybe essentially a credential associated with it. Hopefully not. And that's it. And when you need to use something, you get the things you need to use. And having spent some time at Salesforce, Salesforce users model, not user model, actually works that way. The authorization model actually can work that way. And so I was thinking like, oh, wait a minute. I never thought about the application of this. So I kind of put a position out there. And I thought I'd get a little bit like, eh, it's interesting. No. <laughs> like, a variety of people were like, that's horrible. You got it wrong. <laughs> so we wrong. That was what I wanted. Um, I got introduced to, I never saw least privilege written as polyp. Like P O O P, like mm -hmm. I was like, I've never seen that before. I'm like, what the hell is polyp? <laughs> and then someone pointed out like off Slack. I'm like, well, we're great at creating acronyms. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's new. But then there was like a real meaty discussion. And that sort of kicked some of these things off. I've subsequently been writing about it and talking to more people um, because by no means is this is this idea solidified, right? I'm still like kind of it's like molten glass that's starting to harden, but I'm still trying to shape it a little bit. And it's just been super fun to like see where it goes. So Alex, have you been thinking about this and what's your free time? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess I'll, I'll drop some spicy takes here to start. Uh, I would say totally agreed with your post. And in fact, it's something that I think, uh, you know, we, we really embraced when we started Conductor One sort of in the same thinking, which was that, this idea of, of least privilege and constantly shaping, like the, the focus on shaping roles and permissions is a little bit of just like a, it's the wrong approach, it's the wrong thing to focus on. I think there's, I think there is um, room for it, but in the right context, like in general, uh, th this is, I think the problem with all things security and identity is like a, a concept might be good, if, but if it's misapplied or grossly applied too broadly then it kind of doesn't end up making sense and i think where where least privilege makes a lot of sense is when you've got you know a machine or a service something that's doing the same thing consistently and doing it repeatedly and in a um a kind of um predictable manner because you can you can reshape things and you can define what that thing needs to do its job kind of consistently but for humans and accounts and you know services always it's like uh it's kind of this concept of um the analogy is like zero based financing budgeting have you heard of this like you start from zero and then everything has to be justified mm -hmm. <laughs> and i think that makes way more sense for for humans and for uh service accounts and things like that where you really everything should be built up and re-justified and then torn down if that justification is removed or if people don't need it anymore and it makes way more sense to kind of constantly have the, um, you know, the, the world reverting to zero versus, you know, reverting to maximizing privilege. So yeah, 100% agree with you. And I think the, the, the point I really want to point out, because there's a variety of ways of how you operationalize that. We can leave that, we can get to that later. But the thing that just really dawned on me was like, wait a minute, I use my account in an enterprise system how many hours a day? Not as many as there are in the day. Right? And if that access, if I thought about, you know, what I could see is just sitting there dormant, it's sitting there dormant that could be used by somebody else if they were to take control of the account. And then that sort of started, the sweater started to unravel when I started to graph it. And I'm like, ooh, that's a lot of exposure time that feels unnecessary, certainly in some domains. And I totally agree. Like, this is not something you need to run out and do everywhere all the time, but like there's certainly some domains, production access, for example, whoever controls DNS in your in an organization, like crank that crap down to zero if you can, because exposure hours there are meaningful from a risk perspective, really meaningful. I think closing the doors, right? That's, you're all about reducing risk at that point. That's why we do it. The operational part of it though, I think is, I think that's the most important part, really, the discussion, because you least privilege in my mind is a reaction to the inability to operationalize something like zero standing privilege. Organizations don't have enough resources to constantly sit there and say, Alex, how's your access doing? Are we good? Can I take anything away? Take anything away? Yeah, you know, my background is in ID administration, running teams and granting permissions, et cetera. I mean, we're behind just trying to keep up with an organization that's constantly hiring, firing, removing. 
to do zero standing privilege, I think you have to have a level of maturity from a operational standpoint, which means automation. How can we, you know, not turn this into Jeff pushing buttons on the screen and turn it into some sort of dynamic environment that is data driven that says, oh, this context part of Alex or Lance or whoever has changed. And that means this other thing changes. You can't do that in the real world by hand. It just doesn't work. You can't keep up. And so I think the least privilege has, be, has really been the result of automation hasn't existed. It's a fairly new construct in the identity world and new meaning within the last 25 years, let's call it, right? Being generous. But that's my take on this is we, yeah, of course, zero standing privilege makes sense, but you have it doesn't it doesn't matter if you can't operationalize. What is it? Oh well, it. well, I was going to say just to to add on that a little bit. I think the I think everyone agrees zero standing privilege is super important and it's the right approach. And I, I think in many ways zero standing privilege is going to end up being similar to zero trust. It's gonna it's gonna what people need to recognize is it's a journey. And I think uh, what you, Ian you said kind of about um, specific use cases like production access really privileged roles, maybe in your IDP, things like that. And you mentioned, you know, having automation in different places. What's important to realize is uh, commit to the journey, commit to the, um, the the vision of where you want to go to, which is, hey, for our organization, zero standing privileges is a priority. This is the goal. But there's no, there's probably realistically no world where all your permissions go to zero every single day, the second someone stops using a permit. So think about sort of how do you apply those principles and different automation and technology to production to secure that, you know, so really kind of not thinking about it in terms of like, I need every single tool today mm -hmm. to make this work, to get to zero standing privileges, you know, immediately, but really thinking about how do I apply it um, and just add a little bit, um, you know, to my identity program to make things so, more secure. So Jeff, you're talking about, it won't work with a human in the mix, right? You can't. Mm -hmm. I want to push back on that slightly because the interesting thing about having a human in the mix is in most organizations, the human is going to have a, a different set of context and a different vantage point on what needs to happen. For example, right, you may have a better sense of, oh, we have an active incident. So damn right that Lance is going to get access to the production system because he's the guy to go fix it. So the thing that's interesting to me right now is, and this is bigger than ZSP, is that there's a whole movement around signals and data and the ability to process these things at a higher volume than identity teams have ever been familiar with. Security teams have had some of this, but the ability to bring in a greater set of context into what would notionally be policy starts to make replacing the human more realistic. We still need the person involved from a policy construction perspective. We don't need them from an operational perspective, but we're just at that. I mean, I feel like we're just at that point to really make it happen. Yeah, I think that definition of the orchestration that takes place, you need someone to define what that looks like. Professor, you've been quiet. What's your take on this? <laughs> so I agree with Alex that I love the idea of adopting that as a principle and then kind of pushing that car further down the track when you have opportunities to do so. Because I've seen vendors do this, and some of them do it successfully at a limited scale today. Um, you know, I, I've seen vendors who, when it comes to just getting local admin rights to your workstation, I need to install a software update. Easy example. Um, we have a platform at our company that allows me to step into that role do what I need to do, and then it expires. That part, I'm there, I support it 100%. We have it in uh, our cloud provider today. I had I need access to a role, I step into that role. Now, we do have some operational constraints there. Um, once you try and push that cart further down the, the track, there are technical limitations. Now, that shouldn't be why we don't do it, but operationalizing it, to your point, um, we tried to go with a vendor who very exciting at the OS level, really cool work, but it only worked on Windows. And, you know, the internet runs on Linux, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we need to realize that facade of orchestration for a lot more than that. Or as we were talking about pre-show, do we create a protocol 
that allows systems to speak that language, which we've already tried to do a little bit in the authorization space. I don't know how successful we've been. It's a hot topic. I mean, I feel like the authorization space, we'd probably get to in a minute, but yeah, it's, it's yeah, the yeah. next frontier, it feels like. If we can have an orchestration layer that says, hey, Lance is in an outage, you know, ticket TBD, give him global admin in your tenant so that he can do what he needs to do but it's going to expire in two hours or I have to request to renew it. I'm there. I, I think that's eminently doable. And in many respects, it's already kind of happening today. Uh, getting organizations to the maturity level that they can support that. I think that's where we're struggling mm -hmm. quite a bit. I agree. There's a maturity curve here. And I think, um, I think I just don't want anyone to, to listen to this and, and feel like, they can't get started because <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I think, you know, sometimes we, I mean, we as professionals in identity and security kind of see the future problems of how do we share signals and better policy condition, you know, those things. And just as a, a practitioner who sells software that people implement, I also see a lot of times people are struggling with like the basics, mm -hmm. you know, they're not, oh, yeah. they're not thinking about anything, double black diamond mm -hmm. signal sharing. They're thinking about, how do I just remove access that people don't need? Yeah. yeah. I have way too many people who have access to uh, AWS production infrastructure. How do I get that down? So they're, you know, they're kind of over here. And I, I just definitely think there is, um, we just have to appreciate there's, you know, a little bit of a maturity curve there. I, I get bogged into that worry a lot of times too, because there is a broad maturity curve. There are companies though that are in that space where zero sending privileges and even striving toward the least privilege. Well, the way the reason I say striving is I look at information security policies all the time, blah, 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 least privilege. And then you go in and you're having the conversation about our back. To me, that's like the opposite of least privilege. Let's make it easier and more efficient to administer access. That's it says here your, your information security policy that you're your focus is on giving people the least access that they need. Now, to me, zero standing privilege, you know, um, provides another benefit, which is it reduces your attack surface. You know, and that is huge, right? There's, we, we have to give a nod towards that. But I think that the same knock on zero standing privilege, which is how, how scalable is that, right? How can we take... 5,000 administrators or whatever we say, the, these, this number of roles are the things that we have to provision on the fly as needed only. Um, can we can we scale to that? Well, I think least privilege is the same thing. And that's why you have something like role-based access control, which is that makes provisioning access scalable. Well, so there's this in-between place. Jim, I think one of the things, the parallel here, and I draw this and I read a follow-up, uh, called a field guide to ZSP uh, operationalization. One of the, I, I draw the parallel that there's a lot of similarities to the conversation about automated provisioning. Right? I have yet to, coming back to my analyst days, meet an organization that has 100% automation for every system, for every user and use case. And that that's an anti-pattern. You shouldn't burn your dollars trying to do that. <laughs> that there are high value, high volume systems that automated provision makes sense for. And then everything else is an evaluation of the use case of effort, risk, et cetera. I don't think ZSP is any different than that, which is to say there are some places where the exposure is enough to justify the effort. And then the evaluation criteria may be different than what we use to evaluate user provisioning in terms of how would I automate or not automate. But I can go through the same thing. It is always a mistake to be like, I have new trend identity and I'm gonna use it everywhere. Like, no, don't, <laughs> love God, don't do that. Because it only because the cultural impact to what you're doing is so significant, right? And Lance, you, you and I sort of got into this a little bit back in, in ID Pro Slack about, hey, where does this configuration of variation come from? Is this is a CMDB thing. Like, are we moving the risk from XYZ system, which is in the identity domain, to now a system configuration domain who may not be as familiar with like, and there was some back and forth that I don't think there's a good agreement on that. Which may or may not even exist. Right. No, it, it doesn't. And, it, you know, that was kind of the point. And obviously I agree because that's what I said. But um, I, I, 
Our temptation in this industry is to find something and pretend as though that's the silver bullet for solving yeah. a lot of our problems. And the answer is a blend. As you were talking about, RBAC has a place. If I have a group of accountants that all have the exact same five applications with the exact same roles, I have no reason to implement ZSP in that context for that specific you know, oh, I just set, set of entitlements. I actually, I, I wanted to add on to that too. I okay. think, I do not think RBAC is an anti pack Actually, I, I think you can hold these two things in your hand. I think you can do RBAC and also apply ZSP to it. Our role-based access control is just a justification for why you get that access in the first place. But there's no reason that you couldn't grant all of your accountants a bundle of access and say, oh, and by the way, the things that you don't use in 30 days is going to go to zero. We're going to take it away. But if you need it back, We'll give it back to you really easily. You just have to have an automation in place. So that that I agree with the principle behind it. That shifts the overhead to the example that Ian's talking about, where if I can't orchestrate all of that, yep. then you're making my identity. So, 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 then, so, so then let's look at the thing that's falling over. Right. The thing that this breaks in this moment is we're going to shift a rule definition, let's say, from my IGA system to maybe my access management system. And so I'm still gonna use RMAC, I'm still gonna assign some of these entitlements. The vehicle by which I do that is different. Do I have a way to remove that after a certain time? Period? Crap, I don't know, right? Like you get into these other things. So Lance, the thing I'm gonna push back on is you're still going to have the same sort of administrative requirement of analyzing users and what they need. The vehicle for expression of that is different and this is the problem, is there isn't consistent orchestration of these kinds of things. And most, many, many, probably most, target systems, the ones you want in our management, don't have a sense of ephemerality. Maybe yeah. you can jit in, but you don't have a good way to get out. Like, you know, so now you get into the real rubber meets the road problem. And I think um, the, the point here is not lost on me too, that you always have to assess as the person implementing these changes and making this, getting this work done, is the juice worth the squeeze? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is the is making an accountant's access ephemeral for certain systems actually doing something meaningful and material, um, or is it not really? Why are the so accounts we always zero those accounts? Like, the accounts are an example of this. We like, know they're not listening to the podcast <laughs> right now. No, no risk of offending the accountants on this podcast. podcast. Somebody listens to these anyway. So I, I think that's a great point, and, and I, I think to make David Broussard smile a little bit, you could make the argument that that's where the appeal of keyback can be because the accountant doesn't natively have that access. It's based in policy. And maybe that's why we pivot at that from an authorization model, which obviously could be a pot into itself. Um, I think I'm there with you. What I'm trying to make sure of is, A, I don't hate my users or make my users hate me. Maybe right. 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 And some of my users are my security admins who are going to be directly impacted by this. Now, if I can automate that where once they log in and they click a couple of switches, they can step into the roles that they need to to execute their primary day functions. I'm kind of okay with that. Yeah, the, the example that comes to my mind is the help desk people. They're resetting credentials all day. Yep. Do we want them to check out that access every time they need to reset a credential? That's going to make their job much less efficient. I think, you know, the other thing is you could say, well, the beginning of the day, they check it out, they use it all day, they leave but then they work a different shift next week and none of it works and like, oh, all hell breaks loose. But do they pose enough of a risk right. that you should say yeah. zero standing privileges? So uh, a, a derivative of that is as we get ubiquitous, unfishable, strong authentication everywhere, the attackers are going to move to other places. It's gonna be about session exfiltration. It's gonna to be token exfiltration. And so what I worry about is that we're going to need other kinds of mitigations, right? We're going to need other kinds of identity adept kind of controls. And so one of those things is ZSP is adding to that when now the new attack frontier is going to be session exfiltration. We're going to need to put some layer in there to actually help that. So while I agree, like, you don't really need that access. 
you know, checking it in and out would be cumbersome, especially if it's manual. After that, it's not happening. Uh, but it's the great, I have this persistent thing, especially if we're talking session ID, toolkit. How do we address that problem? Because that's that's a now problem. And that's what, yep. you know, ITDR notionally talks. Well, I don't know, it depends on what flavor of ITDR we're talking about. To like jump servers and right. session ID. ITDR is like the net underneath of people who are swinging back and forth on the the swings and they're a hundred feet up and if they fall, they fall into a net. I almost, I've been like struggling with maybe ITDR should be the first thing we do. I thought you were going to say like, I've been arguing like no net. Like, like, really net. Yeah, like really go. That's way I'm say. <laughs> the tricky thing even with ITDR is that it'll tell you maybe if you have a problem. I think the, the, the trick is particularly with something like session exfiltration. And if you look at where that would be potentially devastational is like you know infrastructure access, yeah, data access absolutely. that matters. I don't want to hear, I don't want to find out about, I really want to prevent it from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think the the real question is how do you achieve that? And I think this is where you gotta, I, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a little bit of a zoom out here because I think identity is part of the problem, but I think you have to look at the whole attack chain and actually go a little bit broader. So for example, we use, uh, Hopefully my co-founder won't get mad about me saying this, but we use uh, Chromebooks only for production access mm -hmm. because we're, you know, with strong authentication and YubiKeys with just-in-time privilege escalation because we don't want to worry about session exfiltration. I had a conversation with Bob Lord at, um, I think it was an Authenticate conference in like Seattle or whatever. And that was one of the things he talked to me about when he was... For people who don't know about where he was at the time, I think he was he had just come out of a role of like so, DNC, CISO for Democratic National Party, stuff like that. And that was the same thing he was preaching back then. This was like maybe three years ago was he got everybody on the Chromebooks because they were just safer, <laughs> generally speaking. So it doesn't surprise me that, that, that that's, you know, there. But only I think because there's such a small part of the population. It's like, well, people going after Windows <laughs> because everybody used Windows. And then they came, okay, well, Mac is starting to get, you know, popular. So people are starting to go after that. Chromebooks are a very niche market. Totally. And it's to the point though, like, is the juice worth the squeeze for production access with, you know, very sensitive access? Yes, for a small group of people. Right. Would I make every employee at the company do all our work on it? No, I would have a lot of people quitting. But then it's actually the same thing that Lance, you said about, you don't want your users to hate you, right? right? Yeah. And yeah. make their life difficult. Again, we're talking about oper operization, operation, we could talk operationalizing this thing and we can't do zero standing privilege if there isn't some way to right. make that actually happen in a more real-time manner without it becoming really crappy for everyone involved i don't want to sit there and have to wait for you to tell me oh there's an incident okay let me grant you the access wait a minute jeff are you telling me that if i said to you hey instead of quarterly access reviews mm -hmm. we're going to do it every three hours people would push back on that i think they would push back but i think there's a way think to people would like I, that i would love to do it's this it's a full-time job and just run it that's a run that's a run yes. yes. right yes. 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 Sell yes. Yes. Out the door. yes but i think this is an area where should we be doing it yes but I was listening earlier, we started to dissect zero standing privileges. Well, maybe this is only really something that's realistic right now for privileged access. Yes, of course, let's pull away domain administrator, global admins, et cetera, from roles. That I think there's a little more tolerance for that to say, okay, I need to yeah, have our structure on that. But if you're talking about the accountant scenario, or doesn't matter, right? Frontline workers, somebody's going in and in you know, McDonald's, or they're on a line construction line and they're very ephemeral jobs even. The only way that that happens is if you have some sort of automation mm -hmm. to make it much more real time. And I would even argue it needs to be more self-service. Yeah, you have to, because you have to make it easy for people to get the access. Back. Exactly. If, right. you, if you take it away and it's not easy to get back, you will have a revolt. The best experience here is the one that the user absolutely never sees. It's like incident happens, help desk tissue, ticket issued, ticket assigned, that person gets blessed. They do their job. End of discussion, close ticket. The stream baker. I'm I'm uh, walking into, I'll use a restaurant because he worked. I worked in restaurants for like a decade and I'm wearing a ring or an ID badge or something. And it's a, what's well, it's Fido, right? So we're, it knows who I am by presence I'm in. And based on data that says I'm working this shift as, you know, a server or a bartender or whatever, front of house expo, whatever, whatever role you want to say. And those, Bits of data are all correlated back with well, what can I do in the POS system? 
I can place orders. Can I adjust prices? No, because I'm not in a management role that day or whatever it may be. The ideal world is I think all these data signals are informing what I can do like that. And that's that's recognition. That's actually recognition versus authentication. And Andre actually sort of bumped up to that topic in his keynote, which I thought was really interesting. Is like, how does that, that rich context get recognized in operational mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously that's kind of where I'm sleeping at the moment is, is thinking about store side um, because borrow a horsemanship analogy, I had to insert at least one in here. Um, I, the principle of making the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard applies. Mm -hmm. And uh, going back to your analogy of uh, talking about the help desk, great example. I have zero issue with telling my help desk employee uh, for the first 10 seconds of your session in that work day, you need to log into the portal and step into that role. That way there's at least a little bit of friction if that credential is compromised that prevents that person from stepping into that role because maybe stepping into that role, I require a stronger method of authentication or recognition in this context. Um, I love the, the recognition idea. I, I think that's, gotta get to it. that's really where our next stage of authentication is. We're just gonna call it something different. So. Yeah, I think that help desk is a great example because if you got into a network with a line workers account, who would you wanna do lateral movement to? Help desk account, because the help Absolutely. desk can go and change passwords and do Absolutely. a lot of things. So and they're the target right. for social engineering attacks. I mean, you're calling the help desk. Well, you, you know, the other one that's really beneficial there is, despite what people would, people wouldn't raise their hand if I asked this question, but how many people are still doing model after in their organization? A lot. A lot. Right. We know that to be true. The nice thing about if you can get to it, at least in certain domains, ZSP, is even if you did model after, but you mm -hmm. did the kind of wrong thing, the exposure window is limited. And so there's a, it's that safety net for the acrobat kind of thing of saying like, look, maybe we're never gonna get away from model after because it's actually access team efficient to do it. But maybe we can make it slightly safer, right? We could put a cork at the end of the fork and like keep you from stabbing yourself when you miss it. <laughs> so the, the one piece that I would like to kind of tug on the sweater a bit, and that's actually two points. Uh, the first one is, uh, your comments regarding governance aside, it's a necessary evil. Um, and one of the challenges of zero standing privilege that honestly exists pre-ZSP is our data about entitlements oftentimes is, I'll just be candid, it's terrible, crap. it's crap. And so that's where you, know, you, you made the joke about the three hour certification thing, but that has to be part and parcel of if we achieve ZSP, Number one, we have to have the way of conveying because Sarbanes-Oxley isn't going anywhere. So if I have that level of access to those systems, I have to be able to describe that in a way that the certifier can look at that, recognize it, and go and make an appropriate yes check uh, on that. Not say again, none of those arguments are against the idea of achieving ZSP. It's just the, the complexity surrounding that. And this is where my nihilism sprung from is that entitlement catalogs are like the most underloved and super important thing, no matter if you're doing ZSP or proficiency or what have you, just the, what the heck does this do? Right. And if I gave it to you, what would you do with it? Like, that's an underloved part of this story. Yeah, now, to your point, the, the piece that could improve out of this is if the vendors realize this in this space, maybe these platforms become better at describing that. Uh, <laughs> I can get into that and say, I know that Lance is stepping into a global admin role for you know accessing these systems and I can use that descriptor now in the certification phase as well. I, I was gonna go exactly here, which is I think I'm not, I actually love governance. I mean, yeah, truth it doesn't make it really a company <laughs> governance, but it's cool. Uh, the, 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 it's the problem where the problem lives and the root of the problem is that systems and ways that the governance platforms have been built historically are not good at self-describing what these entitlements mean and what they are. And I think that's the piece that's missing. And there's never, we talked a little bit about protocols earlier. There's never been a protocol that existed for systems to try to describe. You were, these. you were so spot on. And I'm thinking of uh, Darren Rawls, mm -hmm. CTO at Waveset. Uh, went into sale point long ago. He wanted to create a 
protocol, this is when SPML was a thing. He wanted to create a sister protocol that basically was a drive-by descriptor protocol. Basically, say like, tell me what your roles are and what do they mean? Mm -hmm. And that was a long ass time ago, but like, he's not wrong, right? The, how do I do discovery of meaning of these things? Shameless plug for, we have an open source ecosystem called Baton that we invented to solve exactly this problem that has connectors for a hundred plus major SaaS's infrastructure and so forth. And anybody can use, by the way, you don't have to buy a connector want to do that. But I, I want to talk about this because I think that this is so important that systems be able to describe what their entitlements are, what their roles are, what it means in terms of how they're granted, be able to provision and deprovision. That's always been missing in the identity space. Absolutely. And authorization is a mess. And we we have to think about how we we bridge that gap of systems describing entitlements, roles, permissions, and so forth to a governance system so that those governance systems can be more effective. Yeah, and part of what makes that such a challenge is the speed of change of the that infrastructure has gone up exponentially. Yeah. There was a time when I would stand up an application and the hardware was good for at least three to five years. And so I could mold permissions around that and I could certify against that. Now it happens at the speed of light when a Kubernetes session fails and all of a sudden we've spun up a new container. In milliseconds. Yeah, literally. Right. That's, why, that's why I'm so heavily invested in the idea of to really do ZSP, it requires automation. There's just no way around it. Yes. Yeah. If now we can dissect it and say, okay, well, we're only doing ZSP for this very narrow scope of privilege or social media accounts, right? Or whatever it may be. That would actually but be if the goal is, use case. is truly zero sitting privilege, you cannot do it without a massive amount of data, not only just data, quality data, timely data, but automation to do things with that data to the things that need to change, the, all the different systems. So this, I think this is the new sort of battleground, if you will, because if you buy into the identity, the idea of an identity fabric, right? A bunch of services that have capabilities, each of which have a different buying cycle. The IADP is a 10 year cycle. Maybe my, you know, this is a, my, my PAM is a different one. All of them have to read from the same score sheet. So data, orchestration, and then policy. Like that's gonna be the new thing. And the problem is that right now our market definitions, what is admin time, what is runtime, what is IGA, what is access management, are woefully mismatched to the world that is those three things in an identity fabric. And there's no simple reconciliation there. And again, we love our definitions. So like, oh great, we're gonna define yet another thing. Like that's a horrible outcome, but we have this mismatch terminologically, which is holding people back from thinking about what they could be doing. Oh no, no, IGA does this. No, no, you're thinking about it slightly skewed or in, in an older definition. So. Yeah, I mean, there's a combination of technologies here in play that you really are needed to make this happen. Mm -hmm. It's not just IGA. It's not just a privileged access management tool. It's, or your IDP. It's, it's, it's your workday, it's your ADPs, it's all your identity, identity data sources. It's the, you know, the contract spreadsheet because nobody puts them in your <laughs> yes. HR platform, right? It's stuff like that that are, this is the real world. Yeah. This is yes. what happens it's in the real world. How do we design around that? Because what we're talking about here is a 10 year from now, 15 year, 20 year from now solution doesn't help people today. And, and you inadvertently backed into a new act then, by the way. Oh, what did it DOP? DOP yeah. orchestration and policy. Mm -hmm. Can't take credit. <laughs> You're the first folks. Like the Cheeto, we've uh, the Cheeto, Cheeto like, as the Cheeto. Identity identity Jim, you should get a nickel for every time someone says Cheeto. You voiced it. Or, or, or a Cheeto, a literal Cheeto. Cheeto. I like the good Cheeto costume. <laughs> uh, get it on stage. Let's just make it happen. A Chester costume. Can we raise money for that? Yeah, that's next Chester year. Can we raise Chester Chester money? Cheeto. <laughs> I would be sharp. I mean, I feel like we could talk probably about this for hours and hours. We're already at like 45 minutes. Oh, well. Um, Are we on hard drive space? Just tell us. I, you know, I am running on hard drive space. That okay. is for sure. Cool. Uh, video takes a lot of space, especially 4K video. I mean, you know, there, I, I, we, we like, do uh, not deserve 4K. I, I was going to say, like, middle you did not need to do 4K. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's <laughs> like, like, so like, so like, cool. Yeah, that's such a great There needs to be a better way to do this. What I want to do is close out with, what do you think was more difficult to try and solve for zero standing privileges or to try and pick up a greased watermelon. 
And then, as we were talking about earlier, the small watermelon or yeah, big watermelon. Yeah, small watermelon. You have to do the full-time text here. So, so this was before we hit recorder. There was some, somehow we had a conversation about the Whitewater Training Center, Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then somehow greased watermelons entered the conversation. And then Alex, you took it a step further. Like, well, are there small ones or big ones? Like, what are we talking about? Anyway? We're, we're problem solvers here. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm going to ask you that the first... And I'll be the first one out of the gate with this and say it's actually uh, it's easier to do ZSP because there's no potential workman's comp issues yeah. when you're trying to lift a greased water. Mm, okay. yeah, like that could happen. So I think ZSP is a little bit safer. What if I sprain my finger clicking on a policy creation button in a mm. piece of software? Is that workman's comp? Clicking on an access I mean, request. It actually is. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> what if you sprain, you sprain your finger clicking all the access reviews? Yes, yes, right, yeah, yeah. 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 Rubber stamp. Rubber stamp. Yeah. Rubber stamp. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's Thankfully, my wife will never listen to this podcast because she works in workman's comp, but uh, that, that would be considered a repetitive stress injury and would thus be covered under your policy. Identity. Well, unsafe at every stage. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we're the bad boys of uh, information security. Right. How about that? <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a great conversation. I really do appreciate you guys taking time. I know it's a busy time. We have lots of people reaching out wanting to have conversations, but I'm really happy you guys were able to set aside an hour for us and kind of talk through things. I don't know if we actually solve anything, but I hope we got people thinking about things, right? There's so much more to this, this idea. I think, I think the goal should be zero standard privilege. Let's mm -hmm. get there, but let's take ZSP as the end and let's start working our way back. What do we need to get to that would be a, a fruitful exercise. And it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Right? There's going to be a variety of technologies, investments, people, process, technology, all that stuff right, to make it happen. So hopefully people don't get discouraged, right? And I like to kind of point out for is like, yeah, look, there's, it is a realistic goal, but it takes quite a bit today to get to that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's a worthwhile attempt. The scary is mm -hmm. job security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the thing that I saw <laughs> is COBOL. What's your point? <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I try and do, and I'm experiencing this in my current role, is they they talk frequently about what does good look like, and, mm -hmm. and that's a worthy discussion, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this context. But I also like to ask the question: What does better look like? Yes, yeah. just. Yes. Pushing that one step further, reducing a risk by 1% has a material benefit. And if, if we can take that principle of zero standing privilege and just say, what if we just start playing with this around here? Do we achieve that with some of these decisions that we make? We're already advancing the, the cause. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, any improvement is an improvement. And taking an ROI-centric approach to, okay, actually, we have a lot of risk over here. Let's do that first. Yeah. All right, we're going to leave it there. I'll have links and show notes to connect with everybody on LinkedIn. And we can talk about grease watermelons or <laughs> zero standing privileges or just anything in general. Uh, let's see what else. We are on the web, idacpodcast.com. Yes, Jim, I will do the YouTube. Um, plug youtube.com slash at idacpodcast. Go to our website. Click the link in the upper hand corner. Take it right there. Mastodon at idacpodcast at InfoSec.Exchange. I really hate the way Mastodon and like that whole thing does their thing. Yeah, knows? it's just not great. I know, it is a problem. Um, and then Twitter or X or whatever it's called when you eventually hear or watch this at IDAC Podcasts and we'll have links as well. So hopefully uh, people will enjoy this conversation. I know I did. I, I, I like having these art of the possible, no clear answer, <laughs> but there's general agreement and consensus that yeah, there's something here that we need to continue to work on as, a, as an organization or as a group. Or an industry. What is a group of identity called? It's called a, a disagreement based on a dinner in mm. Seattle uh, that Sarah Chicati had at her house. Uh, Ian, were you there? I was not. You're not there. I've heard um, of it though. Yes, and so there were several people there, and that was that was actually my first like meeting of actual real identity. So it was very cool. But yeah, and a disagreement of identity professionals is what I guess it was called. Well, at least we're not calling it a murder. A <laughs> murder. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's leave it there. Thanks everybody for watching, listening, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.